Good morning. Okay, basically what I'm gonna do now is start uh, the uh, start the thing, even though no one's here yet, but we'll see how it goes and uh, go through the stuff and I will continue where I left off yesterday. So uh, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy this. Please let me know what you think. So let's start again where we were before. Okay, basically what I'm gonna do now is finish the slides that I started uh, last time, we worked on last time, talked about these things. So let's get going with this. Okay, so uh, let's start here. Okay, very good. Uh, all right, now the standard enthalpy of a reaction is the enthalpy of a reaction carried at one atmosphere. And that, that's really, really important to understand the nature of what conditions it takes at. For example, it would be in, the, in a beaker or some other vessel or in the open air somehow. Or even in the human body because for all practical purposes, any reaction that occurs in solution is in one atmosphere under normal circumstances. So it's important to keep that all that in mind. Now, if you recall, when you have a reaction like this, uh, any, any common reaction associated with this, there's ratios associated with each of these and so essentially the heat of reaction of the product is the heat of, uh, of the whole thing is the uh, heat of reaction of formation of, of the products minus that of the reactants. So you got products minus reactants at the beginning. So that basically is the heat of reaction. So these coefficients in front of them like the C, the D, the A, and the F are all related to this balanced equation that we're dealing with here. So basically the key thing is the balanced equation that we're, we have. So let's go through some examples here. Uh, essentially, this is a summation of the products minus that of the reactants. And essentially that's how you get the heat of reaction. You can also measure this by experiment. by doing the experiment. And hopefully one of the labs we're gonna do this semester is uh, doing a heat of reaction experiment. Now, Hess's law is a very important part, basically saying that essentially if you go through a series of steps, like say for example, if you've got a reaction that goes from react the products in one step, one step, it's the same as going from reactants to products in five or four. So essentially you got one, two, three, one, two, three, four steps to get up there. And essentially that is equal to it because again, the key thing is where you start and where you stop, start and stop. Doesn't matter how many steps you use to get there. Enthalpy is a state function. When we're dealing with this, essentially we got a state function here. So I'm gonna erase this and talk about the enthalpy.
And uh, an example of this would be a series of steps going from graphite all the way down with oxygen, where you have the reaction here. In one step, this would be one step here, one step. Or if you go the CO, CO as a thing. So essentially, this could be charcoal or graphite. And then you get the CO first. And then down here, you get CO2. That's why, believe it or not, you, people don't use charcoal heat houses because carbon monoxide is a poison. Very important to understand that, okay? So basically incomplete burning, you get carbon monoxide there. And so basically when you burn charcoal, there has to be a lot of oxygen to generate the heat that you want. Okay, and that's what would occur in say a charcoal stove or something, but you got to provide a lot of oxygen for that to occur. So it's important to kind of see all that, how that, all that works together there. And uh, an example here, you go to graphite first, and that has the, and then the second step is going all the way to carbon dioxide, and that's equal to the same thing as going things. You can add the two together, and this cancels out with that. As you go through that, this totals up to be one, and then you've got your product. Now, here's a sample problem related to that. And uh, what I like you to do is write this down on your paper. So you can see kind of how it works regarding this kind of reaction. Now, how would you solve this kind of problem? Well, you write the enthalpy formation for CS2, okay? And basically you start with graphite plus 2S rhombic goes to CS2, okay? That would be if it was on one step, but it's not in one step to do that. Add the given reaction so the result is a desired one. Well, you can easily burn graphite in a bomb calorimeter, plus oxygen gets CO2 there, and you've got that certain heat of reaction. That's a very common experiment. Okay, and basically you have the rom you have the carbon graphite and the rhombic there. The rhombic added to that, you add the rhombic in there plus the two CO2 goes to that. That would be two of them. So you have to have two of these here, the rhombic on that. These are both on this side of the reaction. So essentially those are both on the same side and we'll eventually get to the other side. There, so basically you have to have the other part, CO2 plus 2SO2 goes to the rock, goes to CS2 liquid plus 3CO2 there. And this is essentially inverted. So notice this and this. This whole equation is spinned around there. and you have your product there at the, that side, you add them all together, certain things common to both sides cancel out, and you're left with your final result, which is the product at the end. And essentially you add the pieces together to this, plus the 172 there, and you get your answer for the heater reaction of that product. And if you were to perform that experiment, 
you would get that number, no matter how many steps you use to do that experiment. Now let's look at another example here. Benzene burns in air to produce carbon dioxide and liquid water. What's the first thing we do first? Well, we set up the equation. C6H6 goes to plus oxygen, goes to CO2 plus water. You balance it. How many carbons on the left? Six. You can put a six there. How many hydrogens on the left? Six. You put a three there. You add them all together. Okay, so now how many oxygens do you need over here? Well, you have 12 plus three is 15. So this has to be 15 halves. You multiply everything by two. Six, so you end up with two C6. H6 plus 15 O2 goes to 12 CO2 plus 6 H2O. Okay, and that basically you have to use that thing to balance it first to uh, solve this equation. Well, how would we solve this problem? Well, I'm going to raise what's on the side again. Let's solve the problem. We start there with the C6H6 with the balanced equation that we balanced earlier. You then set up the product, you set up the reaction like that. You put the values in there for each one. You look on the chart to see what the values are. And then you get the calculation there. And this essentially comes from the chart. And those things are standards related to each of those different compounds. So basically this would be what you're trying to calculate. Very important. And it's in per mole. So you gotta divide by two for that. And that essentially is your answer. Now here's an example of the bombardier beetle defense reacts with water there. And what is the heat there coming off of that? Reacting with, no, sorry, hydrogen peroxide. And the combination there is related to each of those. Adding those all together. This is the amount of heat given off regarding that. And it's an exothermic reaction. So basically it, it sprays hot water at something just reacting with some hydrogen peroxide in the beetle. Now, enthalpy of solution is the next part regarding things. And essentially, when you're talking about a solution, you have, uh, again, you have a solvent and a solute. Okay, and the solute looks like this with a whole bunch of like sodium chloride, a whole bunch of ions kind of sticking together like this. Et cetera, et cetera, going all the way out. And then water comes in into this situation here, and it breaks off each piece, goes off with the water molecule. This is now a plus, attaches to the water molecule. This one attaches to another one. And essentially you got the minus, attaches to the other one here. And that's, that essentially comes off. And that is essentially dis dissolves and that requires energy for that to take place. Does everybody see how that works there? Well, it's re relatively simple. 
let's erase my writing on there. So you start with the heat of solution there with the solution minus the components of that. What substances could be used for melting ice there? This is an example related to that. And if you look at the heat of solution of the different things, what substances could be used for that? And basically the, the ones that are best are this because they generate heat. And this lowers the, lowers the melting point. And MP, that's the melting point. So basically, you, you have a variety of different things related to this. And then down here, this would be for a cold pack. You just mix those into the, there and you can it will get cold for you. And that's what that is related to the nature of those chemicals. And hopefully we'll have an experiment related to that as well. The solution process for sodium chloride looks like this. In the solid state, there's a lattice energy associated with it here. And then it heats up hydration. So it goes to sort of a gaseous state in solution. And then you got the water molecules going around it and the heat of solution overall going directly. This is what, this is real life because it's in water. Okay, whereas here, this is the theory, ignoring water, <sighs> ignoring water at this point. Okay, but then you got the water added uh, on this side. So this is broken into two parts to kind of describe it. Step one, let's step two, and essentially the heat of solution for sodium chloride is four kilojoules per mole there related to that. That's how that can be calculated in real life. Okay, so that essentially finishes energy uh, on this portion. Are there any questions that anybody has? Uh, what I recommend you do is read the chapter for energy carefully and work some problems related to that. And, uh, and then email me with any questions you have or come and see me in my office. Um, for those of you just taking this online, uh, I just recommend you arrange a chat session with me and we can go over any problems you might have as well. So um, what I'm going to do now is switch to the next thing. And we're going to talk again about the gas laws, going over again what we did before, but bringing energy into it because essentially we had a discussion last semester in gas laws without really understanding the nature of energy in the system. And so what I'm gonna do now is kind of uh, switch gears a little and add this to it, essentially, so we can see how this all works. So let's, let's go back to the next part here. And uh, I, I'm gonna open up some more slides related to this. Okay, well, what I'm gonna do now is open up the slides here, go back to it, so be patient a little here. And what I'm gonna to do today is essentially address the kinetic molecular theory, this and uh, 
briefly go over what was discussed a little bit last semester, but get into the kinetic molecular theory of gases so you can see how this fits with energy. So let's, uh, let's uh, begin now. Now, if you remember kinetic energy, kinetic energy is equal to the one half the mass times the velocity squared. And here we're talking about velocity of gases. Okay, so basically as gas molecules move, they have kinetic energy. Where does that kinetic energy come from? Well, it comes from radiation that causes vibrations, vibration of atoms or molecules atoms or molecules. That's where it comes from, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is go over the theory here so you can kind of see how this all works together, okay? The kinetic molecular theory, it's based on the motions of gas particles and this is the kinetic energy. This is the Ke that I was talking about before. A gas behaving exactly as outlined by KMT is known as an ideal gas associated with that. And while no gases are found in nature, real gases can approximate ideal gas behavior under certain conditions of temperature and pressure. And basically it's very useful to use the model equation uh, that is the ideal gas law, which is PV equals NRT. And that's what your book concentrates on mostly but I'm gonna go over a little background so you can kind of see again, what, what the nature of the, the chemistry, the, the experiments that were done for this uh, and what they used to do the experiments. And then from those experiments come to some conclusion about how gases work. The principal assumptions associated with these, gases consist of tiny subatomic particles the distance between the particles is large compared to the size of the particles themselves. So if you've got a ball, it'll have a bunch of gas particles like this, and most is empty space, mostly empty space. So basically the gas, these are the molecules that are in it associated with that, and basically, that makes these easily compressible. These also move and they collide with the sides. So, and each other, okay? So you got collisions that go on between them. Gas particles have no attraction for one another. And basically, because of that, they have no attraction for one another. Gas particles move in straight line, colliding with frequently with one another. Uh, and you have the, the walls of the container and you have press pressure and pressure is equal to the force divided by force per square meters or square area squared. Okay, so the pressure's in there and basically the force comes for mass times acceleration here. So essentially the, that is the mass of the atom or molecule. Okay, and it collides. So basically it provides a pressure uh, on that side. No energy is lost by the collision of the gas particle. Practically, they bounce one off another and all collisions are perfectly elastic. Now, does that work in real life? Well, sort of. 
it's very useful to do it with basic chemistry experiments, but then you got to make corrections based on what the gases are, and we'll talk about that a little later. The average kinetic energy for the particles is the same for all gases at the same temperature, and its value is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature. And if you remember what I talked about regarding temperature, temperature is essentially measuring velocity. It's a measure of velocity of things. So essentially you've got the velocity related to that. Heat, heat is essentially mass and velocity. So you got both of them working together there. Related, related to that. Okay, so basically you got the two things. He is the mass and velocity. That is the kinetic energy associated with it. Mass, one half the mass, velocity squared. So that's where the kinetic energy is involved there, okay? And all gases as the same kinetic energy at the same temperature. As a result, lighter molecules move faster than heavier ones. And that's very easy to kind of illustrate yourself. It's, it's very easy. It's a lot easier to throw a, a, a wiffle ball than it is a baseball. And the, the mass of a hydrogen molecule is two. The molar mass of an oxygen molecule is 32, and essentially they will have a four to one re re relationship. The velocity is four to one related to that. That's because there's a square. Now, uh, I, I highly recommend you read the Hein that I gave a PDF of you again to read the definitions and context, and you'll understand, but diffusion is essentially the ability of two or more gases to mix spontaneously if they, until they form a uniform mixture. And basically with those, essentially you have a series of uh, uh, problems that you work together on, um, essentially measuring them separately, if you wish, the di different pressures of the gases. And we'll talk about that a little later. But if you have any gases in a room and say, for example, someone enters a room wearing perfume, eventually the person on the other side will smell it. And basically that's due to the gas molecules moving across, filling the whole room itself. So here's an example of bromine and air mixing together. You add the two together, open up the vessel, they end uh, eventually form there. Diffusion occurs until they both have the same concentration on both sides. Effusion is a process by which gas molecules pass through a very small orifice from a container at high pressure to one at lower pressure. And an example of that would be a leaky balloon. And then the rates of effusion of two gases at the same temperature and pressure are inversely proportional to them. And basically Dr. Graham did some experiments and came up with this law and basically came up with that relationship. And in Hein, there's a bunch of little problems you can work on that'll kind of illustrate that point better. What is the ratio of effusion of CO to CO2? If you look at the different rates associated with that, the molar mass, the effusion rate is 1.25 related to that. So that means the carbon monoxide will go faster than the carbon dioxide just because it's a lower mass material. Now, how do you measure pressures of gases, force per unit area? And force equals mass times distance. No, acceleration, sorry. Force equals mass times acceleration here. And essentially work is equal to force times distance. And that's where we have the delta E that we saw 
in the last chapter equals Q plus W. So basically force and distance is related to that there. Uh, but pressure has to do with those gas molecules moving around and colliding with the side of the container. And I'd recommend you take your hand and sweep it through the air and you can feel the gas hitting uh, your hand as you go through it just by uh, <laughs> moving your hand through the air. Uh, you can feel that for yourself and you are there is pressure applied to your hand when you do that. The pressure resulting from the collisions of gas molecules with the walls of the balloon keep the balloon inflated. Now that when you have dry air associated with these, these are the different things in the atmosphere. If you notice, this is 78%, this is 21%, the total there is 99. And carbon dioxide is very low. Okay, much smaller than you might have been lead just by listening to the press. And unfortunately, the press doesn't know much chemistry or atmospheric science for that matter. So it's easy to scare people regarding the nature of the amount of CO2 going in the air. So I uh, really recommend you keep that in context when you think about the nature of the bigger picture. The pressure exerted by gas depends on the number of gas molecules present. For example, if you've got a bag, if you've got a balloon with a whole lot of um, BBs in it and you shake it or, or cup, a closed cup with a lid, you got a bunch of BBs in it and you shake it, that, that the more BBs that are in there, you'll get more pressure of the collisions on the side of the cup. And the temperature of the gas, that has to do with the motion of the gas, how fast they are moving. So essentially this has to do with movement of the particles, which are molecules or atoms, okay? Essentially higher the temperature, more movement. Okay, the volume in which the gas is confined, if you decrease the volume, that will, that will affect that will affect the amount of collisions that gas particles have with the things. So they're all related to that. Now, the terms are used for this is tor or mill, millimeters of mercury is the primary one here that we use. Tor is the unit for it. That's the unit for it in the US. They use often millibars and one bar used to be one atmosphere. That's how it was done, but essentially one millibar there. So 1.013 bars equals one atmosphere there, okay? And then inches of mercury would be that. Or four, and 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's one atmosphere associated with that. And basically it's used by measuring a bar with a barometer. And I'd recommend you read the chapter in this portion to understand kind of how it works. But a full tube of mercury is inverted and placed in a dish of mercury. It then cl collapses down there into the dish. This a vacuum is done up there. The, atmospheric pressure pushing the mercury back up. So essentially you've got a potential energy, which is M of the mercury, the G, and then the H of the height of it. There's associated with the potential energy here. And essentially you've got a vacuum <laughs> because this force is going down and this force is pushing back up. So it equalizes that and basically the height is the measure of pressure, the atmospheric pressure pushing up on that mercury barometer. Depends the pressure on the number of molecules and temperature. Pressure is produced by gas molecules colliding with walls of the container. 
at a specific temperature and volume, the number of collisions depend on the number of gas molecules present. And then for, for an ideal gas, the number of collisions is directly proportional to the number of gas molecules. And basically what they do is from experiments, generate formulas to learn and measure. At a specific temperature and volume, the number of collisions depend on the number of gas molecules present, okay? You increase the temperature, the number of collisions will increase. For an ideal gas, the number of collisions is directly proportional to the number of gas molecules present and the temperature. Okay, so here you got a bunch of different examples. This will have more collisions and this will have less. Okay, this will have less, much less. Collisions just by how they interact with one another and the side of the cube. The standard volume at zero degrees Celsius related to this. Twenty-two point four liters at zero degrees Celsius. There. The pressure exerted by a gas is directly proportional to the number present there associated with that. And essentially you have this related to it. The pressure of a gas at a fixed volume increases with increasing temperature. An example of that was you have, a, you have an aerosol can, you put it in a fire, eventually the pressure of the gas inside will get greater and cause the can to explode. And when I was a kid, I used to uh, burn the trash and often have some fun watching the old aerosol cans pop and then go up in the air and it was kind of fun to watch. When the pressure of the gas increases, this kinetic energy increases again, the Ke equals one half the mass times the velocity squared. The increase Kinetic energy of the gas results in more frequent energy collisions with the walls of the container. And different examples of this, the pressure is higher when you have 100 degrees Celsius versus zero. And this can be calculated also related to the more collisions at the higher temperature. Lower T, lower P, higher T, higher P. Now, Dr. Boyle came up with the first thing based on experiments he did. And at constant temperature, the volume of a fixed mass of gas is inversely proportional to the pressure. And basically what he came up with at, was a formula that was essentially this. Volume is essentially inversely proportional to pressure there. So P1, V1, P1, V1 is a constant, okay? At constant temperature, okay? And this is what he discovered, the relationship between both. So if you increase this, increase this from here to here, the other value will go down. So this, the volume will go down as you increase P1 to P2, the volume will go down there. And this essentially shows the inverse relationship of the ideal gas. And that's what Professor or Dr. Boyle um, determined when he did experiments. Now, this is related to what we will be doing in lab and to prepare for the lab that's coming up, I'd recommend that you read carefully the lab as well as the chapter in the book so you understand kind of what you're trying to study 
in this portion of the, uh, the class. The, pre the pressure of, on the volume of the gas here, if you have one atmosphere on a plunger in uh, the volume, you make it two, that, pressure, that volume will decrease. And if you go to four, it'll decrease again. Now, at an eight liter sample of nitrogen as at a pressure of 500 torr, what must be the pressure to change the volume to three liters where T is constant? Well, you, set, you could do it with two methods, determine whether volume is being increased or decreased. You look at the initial versus the final volumes, volume decreases, pressure increases, or, and then you multiply the original pressure by the ratio of the volumes that will release increase in pressure. So essentially you have that 500 torr times eight liters divided by three gives your answer in tors. Okay. And the other method, the algebraic one, I recommend you use this form because this is why you took algebra in the first place. You organize it differently there and you plug it into PV, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. You look and see what you're looking for. So you isolate that, you have P1, V1 over V2 equals P2 and you plug the values in to that equation. Okay, so you write the problem, solve for the unknown. Then you put the numbers in and you calculate it. Charles Law is another one. Dr. Charles came up with the next one and essentially the absolute zero at this, there's no motion at absolute zero. That is why it is absolute zero. So basically that is related to that. A given volume of any gas is cooled by 20 degrees C, essentially related to 20 divided by 273. Absolute zero just means uh, essentially the volume of any gas would become, would be decreased fully. More precisely, it's a zero point on the Kelvin scale. It's, it's the temperature which an ideal gas would have no volume associated with that. It would be a solid. And so there's a volume temperature relationship between them. So at constant pressure, the volume of a fixed mass of gas is directly proportional to the absolute temperature. So here you have V and T related to that. So basically the uh, V1 over T1 equals the constant there. This is another constant at constant pressure. Okay. So the, equa the formula equation there so to that, the effective temperature and the volume of the gas, the pressure is constant at one atmosphere. There, associated with that, you increase the temperature inside that vessel for one atmosphere, the amount will go up in the volume. And a good example of that would be a hot air balloon. Essentially increasing the amount of warm air inside balloon will cause it to expand and then it will float on the atmosphere around it. Well, let's look at a sample problem with conversion factors. You can do that too. And I'd recommend you use this one. I've always found it easier to do that. You set up the problem. You could do the conversion. You've got to convert here. You write the solve for the unknown. You don't know what the unknown is. You put the information into that and then do the calculation. That will get you your, your new volume. Gay Lussac is another chemist. 
that the fixed mass of gas at a constant volume is directly proportional to the temperature. So you have P equals constant times T. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And then a sample problem related to that again. And then an algebraic one set it up before, just like this. You, and then you put the right the equation there, solve for the unknown, and then put the information into the equation. And you notice that these Kelvins will cancel out. Standard temperature and pressure by definition, standard temperature and pressure, that is 273.15 Kelvins or zero degrees Celsius. And what I'm gonna do now is change this, go back and out this. Um, Okay, I'm going back now into it again, back into the slides. So it's now fixed. I'm gonna share the screen with you now again. Here we go, sharing the screen again with you now. Okay, STP, that is 273.15. 5 Kelvin or zero degrees Celsius, one atmosphere, 762. That's essentially how that works. And then you can, you can also combine the gas laws together. And there's another one called Aldrigazzo's law. That essentially the volume is proportional to the number of moles, but the combined gas law, essentially when they change at the same time, and then you can solve a problem related to that. And here's a sample problem there. Method A and then method B. Again, I recommend you use method B, method B to solve this. The algebraic equation you write and solve the equation for the unknown V2 there. Okay, I'm gonna go back and fix this. Okay, the algebraic equation looks like this, right? And solve for it. It's that P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over that. You shift them over to the other side. Certain things cancel out. You, you then have the new for algebraic form of it. You then put the information you need into the thing, and then you get the calculation of the number. Now, the next part is Dalton's law of partial pressures. Essentially here, we have combination. Each gas in a mixture exerts a pressure that's independent of the other gases present. 
the total pressure of the mixtures is the sum of the partial pressures exerted by each one. So the total is equal to PA plus PB plus PC plus PD. And essentially an example of that, a container contains helium at 0.5 atmospheres, neon at 0.6, argon at 1.3. What's the total? You just add them all together. And then an example of something you might do in the lab, collecting a gas sample over water, the pressure in the collection container is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So the gas is the pressure of the water at the collection to, the, to that and the gas collected. So you've got, for example, hydrogen plus that of the water at the certain temperature. So that's a correction factor that's done in, in an experiment where you collect oxygen over water in that. A sample of oxygen was collected in a bottle over water at 25 Celsius. The vapor pressure of the water is there. What's the pressure of the total of the oxygen? So essentially the pressure of the oxygen would be 736 torr. Now Avogadro's law is the next one the essentially Avogadro found we measured at the same temperatures and pressure the ratio of the volumes are small whole numbers related to that let me go back Avogadro's law that basically says that the volume is directly related to N, which is the number of moles times the constant. Constant. At, at constant temp. And pressure. That's Avogadro's law. Gay's law, Lussac's of combining volumes, essentially when measured at the same temperature and pressure, the ratio of the volumes of reacting gases are small whole numbers there. And essentially you will get a change in these. You have different ratios between them. So you have two volumes plus one volume goes to two volumes there. So basically you'll get a different, you will get a smaller volume on the right. So this will be a smaller volume. And this is a larger one. Avogadro's equal volumes of different gases at the same temperatures and pressure contain the same number of molecules. So basically uh, you have equal volume, same things. So essentially in this case, same temperature and pressure, you have the volume equals N times uh, the constant K. That's what I was referring to before. So basically it explained the gas laws of combining volumes and served as a foundation for the kinetic molecular theory and you get the determination of molar masses and densities associated with that. Hydrogen plus chlorine goes to hydrogen chloride there. One molecule plus one molecule goes to two. Two molecules of hydrogen chloride, each molecule, one atom of hydrogen chlorine. There, each molecule of hydrogen and chlorine are essentially two atoms associated with that. So basically, this is how the early scientists determined the nature of diatomic gases. So essentially, diatomic gases were determined by these kind of experiments, reacting one gas with another. Mol molar mass volume relationships associated with that, the volume of one mole of any gas is 22.4 liters. And that is called the molar volume of it at STP. 
at SDP, 24.4 liters for any mole of any gas. That's an approximate value. The density of neon at SDP is 0.9 grams per liter. What is its molar mass? Well, then you can plug the equation into it and determine what its molar mass is related to that. And then the last thing is determine is the density of the mass, the mass in grams over liters. The volume depends on T and P. The molar mass of SO2 is 64.07. Determine the density of SO2 at SDP. Well, you can then determine that using these formula and get the number of grams per liter. That's the density. Now the ideal gas law essentially comes from this, P1, V1 over T1 equals a constant. Okay, this would be a constant there, but if you combine them all together and bring out N, so essentially then you can figure out, you calculate what the constant is, constant for one mole of a gas, okay? And so then it becomes PV equals N, which is the number of moles times R, which is called the gas constant, times the temperature. And this essentially goes over there and then you get the relationship there with the ideal gas thing. And that's essentially everything combined. And essentially if you have P1V1 equals this whole thing being a constant, this is Boyle's law, Boyle's. So everything comes from all the other laws we talked about earlier come from the previous, uh, come from this ideal gas. So the ideal gas law is essentially everything combined where you could change P, V, and T, or, or you can change the number of moles in the system. P's in atmospheres, liters, moles, kelvins. That's the ideal gas constant. And that is equal to that value. And you'll be given that if you do any calculations. A balloon filled with five moles of helium gas at temperature 25 Celsius. The atmospheric pressure is 750 torr. What is the balloon's volume? You organize it, convert the temperature to kelvins, convert the pressure to atmospheres. So you have your numbers there. Write and solve it for the unknown. Then plug, plug those, all the values in there that will get you the volume related to that. And there's a set of problems in your book uh, using that, but this is where your book starts. And you can determine molecular weights using the ideal gas equation, and that's gonna be related to the lab you're gonna do this semester. The molar mass of these different things related to that. And essentially you have G over there. And so the molar mass is equal to G times RT times over P and V there. And the uh, 0 0.02 grams occupies 250 milliliters at a temperature of 305 Kelvin and a pressure. You plug the values in there associated with each of them. The G is the number of grams of the mass of the material you plug all the numbers into that equation and that gives you the molar mass of the gas you wanna do. Now, I believe in the lab you're gonna do, and I've done other labs that they do do this, where you do determine the molar mass of a gas with these kind of calculations. Now, gas stoichiometry, essentially all calculations are done at STP. The gases are assumed to behave as ideal gases. A gas not at SDP is converted there. And then again, it's going 
like moles, grams to moles to moles to grams or some other thing. It could be volume, it could be grams, it could be atoms. It's usually volume or grams associated with this or molecules. Those are the primary conversions. And again, you could do more volume calculations or mass volume calculations. What volume of oxygen can be formed from 0.5 molar potassium chlorate? You break the balanced equation associated with that. You start off with 0.5 molar chlorate. The conversion there, you set up the problem first using the mole ratio method. That gives your answer. You convert the number of moles of oxygen to liters using the formula that tells you how much you will generate. And you can do that with a continuous calculation with that related to it. And that'll give you the answer that you're looking for. What volume of hydrogen collected at 30 degrees Celsius and 700 tour will be formed by reacting at 50 grams of aluminum with HCl? Well, you set up the balanced equation first. You then go through that, putting the val values in there. You get the number of moles of hydrogen. Then calculate the number of liters of them with the number of moles. You plug the values in, and that's essentially a multi-step problem. And then volume, volume calculations go in there too. What volume of nitrogen will react with 600 milliliters of hydrogen to form ammonia? What volume of ammonia will be formed? There, you get those going through those as well. And then with real gases, an ideal gas of basic gas losses, the volume is negligible compared to that. Intermolecular mo motions are thin. With real gases, you get deviations that occur at high pressures and low temperatures. It's not negligible and they do interact there. And so that's related to that part. So that kind of goes over the basics of the gas laws and this will be particularly important in the lab we're gonna do this semester. So I would like you to keep that in mind related to uh, how that works. Okay, are there any final questions? Now, what I'll do next time is continue with the gas laws again and, and uh, the material that's gonna be in our textbook, just so you can have it fit together with what's gonna happen in the first lectures. And then essentially we will continue with new material as we go through the semester. But that is enough background for you to get it so you can understand probably the first lab or two uh, as we start at the end of January. So thank you very much for paying attention. All the best.